Hey, good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be offended. Uh, where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. We do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but they are recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We have all the recordings of all of our shows available on our website, so you can go back and watch them at your convenience. Uh, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, book reviews, uh, whatever um, is anything related to libraries, we want to have it on the show to share. And we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, and we also have guest speakers sometimes, which is what we have this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this morning on the line with us is Jason Clark. Hi, hi Jason. Hey, how are you? Good, we're good. doing good here. Right. Um, and he is on the line with us remotely from um, Montana, as you can see right there, Montana State University Library, where he's their head of digital access and web services. And he is going to tell us about um, search engine optimization, SEO, specifically for libraries and how we can get our libraries out there um, more in in people's faces, I would guess I would say, to be blunt, <laughs> making sure that we're coming up when people are looking for their information. So I am just going to uh, hand over to you, Jason, to go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, thanks, Krista, and thank, thank you, Michael, for, uh, for the opportunity to, guess, to be a guest speaker here. I'm, I'm excited about this topic uh, because it's been a pattern, uh, a thread of my research for probably the, the last uh, year and a half to two years. It's really picked up as a uh, a new dean has come into our library with this agenda specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's me. I'm head of digital access and web services, which is basically building the digital branch for our for our for our library organization, which includes web apps, um, mobile stuff, di digital collections. That whole kind of everything like that is in my bucket. Um, I did want to I sort of hinted at this, but there's there's a huge um, there's been a shift. We had been interested in SEO sort of peripherally, um, and I'm saying we, Scott, who you see the first gentleman there with the rainbow coming out of his head, and then I'm the second gentleman. Um, we had been peripherally interested in this stuff, but um, we had a new dean named Kenning Arlish, who's uh, almost primary, one of his primary research threads is this idea of um, search engine optimization and the ability to create indexable content for library type materials. His partner, Patrick O'Brien, which is the third person, you see, the, the gentleman, um, third in line here, is, is our semantic web research director at Montana State University Library. And I just want to tip my hat to this group in particular, because the work that I'm presenting is, you, you know, it can be culled and aggregated from a lot of different sources, and it certainly has. But the, the efforts of Patrick and Kenning and their sponsorship of this research has really brought it to forward to a next level where uh, we're ready to present some of our ideas like what you're going to see today. Uh, I pushed this through already. There's uh, just logistically, um, I have a pinboard account. That's me. And there's a tag there called libseo. So the, the uh, URLs that we talk about today are, are collated there. And if we, if we come up with other URLs that we want to collect there, I will put them there. So you just, just watch that URL. It's dynamic, and it will continue to be a resource long after the, the session today is done. If you do want to catch me um, today in particular, I'm, I'm fairly active on Twitter. Not as much lately just due to management things, uh, activities. But um, if you tag something with live at SEO, a hashtag, I will pick up the conversation in there and then we can kind of do it at, kind of it'll be a public forum for a continuation of, of our discussion today so uh, I'm going to talk over what you see on the on the page uh, this is a you know a quick agenda I have about an hour um, and I do want to say that you, know, you can see the efforts that we're starting to put into this this is this is something that um, I, I think this is an introductory um, process that I'm giving you there, but there's just lots of research, and um, it's it's a the practice, the act of SEO is search engine optimization is um, requires some some resources to to really do it right. Okay, so I, I just want to 
make that clear as far as framing this discussion today. So we'll make sure it's defined. We'll look at the, the sort of um, the various definitions of what's good SEO or bad SEO. That's the black hat versus white hat distinction. Um, we'll try and talk through a quick business case for why you would do SEO. I, I assume we have a number of people in here today, so there's some interest in it. But you also may have to make a case to different people who have never heard of SEO. And so we'll try to talk through a little bit of that. And then the bulk of the, the, the second part will be these sort of rudimentary, you know, where do you start with SEO techniques? And then I'll allow time for, I'll try to allow time for questions. We might shorten that a bit. If you do have questions over as we're talking, please just let me know, okay? So this is the definition. Let's let you guys read it. I'm not going to read it. I think the, uh, the core de definition there is that idea of creating indexable and crawlable content. Notice I didn't say users in this case. I will sometimes talk about users, but this is primarily a machine-readable act. What we're trying to do is allow the spiders, robots, to come in and learn and then index, learn about our library content and then index our library content so that can be displayed in search engine result pages. So I just want to get this out of the way very quickly. Um, Who's sort of, I mean, people are in here, they've heard of SEO, but who's sort of had this attitude or heard this attitude related to SEO? Anybody? Just, you know, just a quick note in the... Yeah, if anybody, uh, you can use the question section to uh, comment about this. Um, yeah, or just in the comments. This, yeah. Either way. Or on Twitter, either way, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is obviously a huge thing. <laughs> right, because this, this is sort of this, this figure it out. Yeah, th this idea of, and this is this is one of the first things you'll have to sort of uh, get you, make an argument around is that there's there's good ways to do it, and then there's unsavory ways, let's say. And the 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 part of this quote, this is a comment on I think the history of SEO presentation, um, gaming the algorithm and outsmarting Google. That's not our goal. Um, that's not our goal with any of our the, the, the procedures and the techniques we're going to talk about. Okay. So the other thing you sort of get from this idea is this, oh, SEO is snake oil. It's an arms race. You're, you're trying to stay ahead of things. and you're trying, You are trying to game the system. That Again, that's not our goal. That's, what we're trying to do is create um, useful ways to allow indexable content and even uh, vetted and refereed and accepted ways of doing that. Okay. So just to give you a sense, there's this, there's this sort of distinction, black hat versus white hat. We're going to look at white hat SEO. This is typically, and then if you look at the bullet points here, this is the sort of activity where people would say, ah, that's negative SEO, right? Um, and this is, this is where we get that sort of snake oil salesman, you know, the spam, the spam emails. Who's had a spam email that said, I've I've checked your page rank and it looks like you're not you're not even in within the top ten within your market or within your industry. I can help you do that. I can get you on the first first landing page of search engine results in Google. That sort of thing um, is where the bad reputation for SEO comes from. Okay. So again, we're going to do white hat SEO. And you'll notice that uh, the, the links I share, what I point to, I'm looking at stuff like Bing's web Webmaster Guidelines, Google's Webmaster Guidelines, tools that, allow, that tell us what are the accepted techniques, what are the ways that you build indexable content. I just want to make sure people are OK. I am going to be, again, when we talk machine readable, it'll, it'll be looking like the sort of bottom of this. Uh, you have this display in the browser, which is the top screen. The bottom with the one, two, three, four, that's the HTML. Typically, the, the pieces that I talk about are going to be about page elements, document elements, that and markup that we put onto a page. That's one of the common ways of making sure your content is readable and indexable. So everybody's pretty familiar with that. I don't. I don't want to surprise anybody with with some HTML. Let's keep going. So, 
working through that, we sort of defined it, we've kind of worked through what it means to do good SEO versus bad SEO. Um, now, now we're kind of, what, why, why should we do this? You know, what, what is the business case for this type of activity? And the, um, the very simple answer for a lot of us is this kind of sentiment. So this is 2007, Lorcan Dempsey, the VP and Chief Strategist at OCLC wrote this on his blog. The blog is linked right there. Um, but behind that sort of sentiment is this idea that our, our websites are places that people go, but they're not necessarily the only place discovery happens. In fact, they're not even the primary place that discovery happens. So given that kind of sentiment, and I can show you, so just bear with me as I, you know, this is the sort of interface that we're working through, right? So the, I type in NASA, I get NASA's activities, and I even get, if you notice down at the bottom, I get a search nasa.gov. So it's interesting to watch how these search engine result pages can actually become the discovery layer, right? And even in, in our setting, in my setting, the um, a typical um, college professor, college student, uses this as one of their primary interfaces to scholarly material, Google Scholar. And as I was talking about, take a look at the, um, so there's, there's a couple perceptions papers from 2010, also from OCLC. So the full, the full link is down there, and then there's college students, because that's my context. But uh, if you read this, you get a sense of what we're talking about when we say, how important this, this search engines are as discovery layers. So 93%, 93% of our users going through search engine result pages to find, at least initially to find their things. And sometimes it doesn't even go much further than that, right? If it's not within that first result set, that search may, may not continue. And if you take a look, this report is really a, a wonderful resource. Um, so take a look at those URLs. I, I'm not sure if I put them in the link roll, but I will. I'll get them into our delicious account too. So our focus well. to, okay, uh, okay, great. Um, so our, our focus today will really be more on the sort of baseline techniques. And what we'll look at are things like keyword analysis, how to write titles and descriptions, how do you make uh, crawlable content, I would say. I'm making up words as I, as I go along here, so I hope you don't mind. Um, then looking at what our indexes look like, because once you get your, your page, pages inside of Google's index, there may be some pruning, cleaning, winnowing that you need to do to make sure that you're just surfacing the the pages that you need, and I'll show you that a little bit. And then I'll, I'll also introduce a little bit about semantic markup that can help our pages be even more, um, help bots understand them in, in, in a categorical way, um, instead of just uh, as a, a simple P tag or something like that. And I'll kind of, I'll unpack that in a little bit. But these are sort of the baseline techniques, and as I said, um, this is tip of the iceberg stuff. I mean, this is kind of a place to start with it, but as you get more and more into the research, you realize that it's, there's even more you can do besides this, but as, as sort of a baseline, this is, this is a great place to start with some of these, these concepts and these techniques. So what I'm gonna show you is actually, uh, one thing you do is you look at and you consider what makes sense for your, and I'm gonna speak in market terms, because our, we, we work in an industry, an information industry, um, but there are there are certain certain vocabularies, certain keywords associated with that market or with that industry. So part of our first foray into SEO is looking through and deciding on what makes sense for our for our keywords. How do we want to be found? How do we want to be described? Right. This is a different question than we've typically been asking. Usually we've been focusing on display and how do we make a category that 
appeals or, or that makes sense to a user. I mean, if you think about our information architecture and the way our usability uh, in libraries has sort of been structured, it's been focusing on that. What we're going to do in this case is look at how do we want to be interpreted? How do we want to be defined in a broader, you know, search, commercial search engine setting? Okay. Um, I'm actually going to jump out here because I'm going to go to the Google AdWords account and go to the keyword planner so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Okay, so just bear with me as I move outside. And if I get there and you can't see it, please let me know before I start talking, 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 and you're going, I can't, Jace, I can't see anything you're talking about. Can you load this one up. Yep, not a problem. We can see everything you're doing. Okay. <laughs> so this is stuff related to you. Okay, that's fine. I just I'm going to log out of this. It's funny. I have like so many accounts, but I have to log out of this one to get to AdWords and come in as um, a different Jason. I want in. Hold on. So once you register, what you do is you just you register an account with AdWords. Um, there used to be a free and op open tool. It is still free. Um, you just need to write a, a, a associate a Google account with your AdWords. They've just they're starting to create a broader tool around the AdWords uh, service. So for instance, in this case, this is what this is. And when we're talking about keyword analysis, we're thinking through what would it mean to do library. Let's do library information. Let's see what I can get to. Right. Landing page. And we don't really have a category. Let's get ideas. So the first part of this tool tells you where, what are some common sort of Text, you know, facets of ad groups, which is interesting. You can kind of see where, how the how the index sort of understands what library and information science is, and then if you go further to the second tab, you can actually see um, what the actual keywords that are part of the you know the Google Query Index to get a sense of where, you know how how often how often things are searched. Is the competition high for that one? The ad, the cost per click is, you know, for whether or not um, it's worth uh, purchasing. Uh, so you could be in seeded results, the results that appear in the top right of Google currently. But um, this is the sort of idea around um, how you would start with keyword analysis. And you want to do this early just so you get a sense of how you'll see as it trickles down into the other stages of these baseline techniques. What, it, what are the common words that we want to sort of bring into our web copy, into our titles, into our page descriptions? How competitive are they? It's a sort of environmental scan of what's out there. And you could do this with just about any sort of, I mean, like if you were a children's librarian, you could do uh, early, and you wanted your pages to do literacy 
right? You could you could run the same sort of search that and then you would you would come up with ideas for how you would tag um, some of your children's programs pages, right? In this case. So these are the ones that, you know, when you're high or medium, these are the ones that people are using that they're expecting to find things that are resources that would relate to these concepts. All right. Okay, so the, the easiest way to do that is to use this tool. It used to be um, just outside of AdWords, now it's inside, so you just take your Google account, associate it with AdWords, and you can pull in, you can get access to all these the sort of keyword analysis. Once you've done that, then you start to think about how do you incorporate what you've learned from your analysis into um, what I'm calling web copy. And web copy could be you know, text on the page that you actually see, but more frequently it is within these, these type of HTML tags. So there's a title tag that sits at the, in the head of every document. There's also a meta name description tag. And inside of that content, you start, uh, if you think about it, that's, those are the two pieces that appear in search engine result pages, right? You have your, well basically there are three things that appear there. There's a, your, I'm going to type this out, a page title, title, a URL, and a page description. Right? So you think about it, those pieces have to be communicate very clearly what, what your thing is, what your thing is about, what your pages are. Um, and so what that does is it asks us to be really cognizant of what we put in there and how we structure the descriptions for all of this content. Okay? So for instance, if you think through this, um, best practices sort of for, for title, of, of web pages or titles of applications or documents. Um, if you, if you kind of get the idea of that, it's the, you, know, you have a keyword phrase. You don't necessarily have a, the, the quotes. What I'm saying is there's sort of this keyword phrase. And then there's context that you provide in the second piece of the title. Okay. So if you look at that example, what I'm doing here is I'm identifying words that are used and under, understood. So what I'm doing is staff directory and people listing. So they're two different sort of posts or ways to understand or create query um, hits off of those those two, the, the keyword phrase itself, right? Because somebody could say library people, somebody could say staff directory, right? It can kind of go all over the place. And then the context is Montana State University MSU library. And Note the, the way that that is structured in that um, there's Montana State University Library. If somebody searches for just that without MSU, that's a hit. And then if they also search for MSU Library, there's a hit right in, in the title. Okay, so it's this sort of thinking about how do you write this? How do we write for, for indexing, right? And for quick scan inside of a search engine result page. Is that making sense so far? Keep moving. Uh, yes, it is to me. Okay. <laughs> and I should probably say too, I don't, I know um, probably literally nothing about how to do this. I know that it's something important to do and that you want to make sure you have the right, we, we do this in our web pages here at the commission. Sort of, <laughs> to a small <laughs> extent. Um, mainly I've done it as um, thinking off the top of my head what might be a good word to put in there to search, yep. but using that gaggle, Google AdWords is very cool, I thought. Yep. I, I yep. need to remember that trick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, and if it, I'm sure it's linked up. I think I linked up the keyword planner, but I'll make sure that it is. Mm -hmm. um, does everybody understand what I mean by title tag? Those, that's that HTML tag. Mm -hmm. We'll kind of take a look at that a little later. We do have one question that came in, and I'm yeah, not sure ahead. if it's something you've mentioned. Someone wants to know what is the average cost per click? Average cost per click. Oh, average CPC. I, is yeah. that what that is that what that means? Yeah. Cost per click. Yeah. Is that what that column is? Okay. What? How's right. that? So what like, is that? That's about? if you wanted to get a sponsored result. You know, like you're on a search oh, result right. page, and it you know it comes up in that. It, maybe it's the first lot, couple couple results that everybody just scans by and doesn't mm -hmm. actually click on. That's <laughs> yeah. what that's what it would cost for you to get surfaced 
in a result for early child development. Ah, uh, okay. That's a really high one. If you wanted to pay for them to, to do right. that, right. If you okay. want to the pay route. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what AdWords is really about, but it also, I mean, organic, you can use it for organic uh, white hat SEO. Right. There's nothing, yeah. Actually, there's nothing wrong. I shouldn't say pay is, is not white hat SEO. It's a viable way to get into search results. Mm -hmm. But um, we're not focusing on this, sort of the cost option, the pay option in this, in this session. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay. So I just wanted to did the um, if you notice this, here's a title tag. I'll just open this up so you can see. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. There's also there are meta tags and here's the meta name description, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Just so you understand where it fits into the web markup of the page itself, that's the piece that's going to get indexed and shown. Okay. Um, so the same sort of thing would happen with, you know, you've done your keyword analysis, you're starting to think through, um, so you're incorporating your keywords as you laid it out in your title. And you want to sort of create complementary links between the, the keywords and, and the, that you're using in your title and the stuff you're using in the description. So you notice here I have listing, staff, Montana State MSU library, library departments, roles, job titles, phone numbers, and contact information. Right? So that's a, that's a strong description of a staff directory landing page, right? And it, it does have links up into, you know, it links concepts from the title and it pulls them out and explicates them in the description as well, okay? Okay, so along with this, you have a, this is more of a, let me just make sure. The next step is is making sure that the the sort of the directories of your site are um, can be actually crawled or followed. And what I mean by this is if you think about something like let's go back to Scott. Okay, this this one kind of makes sense because we've got we've got a base URL that's inside. Of, then there's a directory called people. And then there's an about inside of there with Scott's information inside. So one of the things you want is that trajectory of folders inside of your website to sort of describe the hierarchy of your, of your website. That helps the, the robots understand the, sort of the, the index and the crawl and the relationships between your, your different pieces of your site. Okay? So that's kind of what I'm talking about with this piece of the slide. Um, there, uh, the, if you're familiar, um, bread, breadcrumb type links are another thing that allows them, so every page has a sort of hierarchy built into it that the, the index, the robot can kind of understand that, you know, this is part of a resources page and this is the nursing resources, something like that. Let me show you an example of that. Exactly what I was talking about. So you can see right here this kind of architecture onto the page, right? So there's a classification on the page itself. That's what I mean by the, the sort of simple crawlable markup. So you've got directory structures that sort of explicate what's going on, and then you've got links on a page that allow you to get to and from, and also define the, the categories, the relationships between the pages. You notice I put that quote on there. Every page should be reachable from at least one static text link. The webmasters, uh, a, a lot of the documentation is that's it's linked in the link role itself. So, but, but that those the webmaster guidelines are really where I've culled a lot of the information that you see related to the talk today. Um, the other thing to do is actually create a machine readable sitemap. So this is all the pages that you want to be indexed and and the index priorities for those pages. Google uses sitemap protocol 0.9. I'll show you what one of those looks like. So if you look at, I'm going to do one more tab. If 
Okay. okay. So what this is, this is a list of all the important pages from this digital collection. And you can see what it does is it gives you get a URL location. When it was last modified, this was actually today. Um, how often does it change? And then you give each URL a priority. And you can see this is just a basic, there's nothing, this is behind the scenes, right? It's just XML. Um, but what you do is you create this and then you go into something like Webmaster Tools and you let, you register your site and you let them know that this sitemap exists. And then they start to build an index around, so along with the two, the two pieces, you've got that, that sort of breadcrumb and directory stuff on the front of your pages, but then you've got this back-end machine-readable XML file, sitemap, that also identifies what pieces of the site need to be indexed. And actually, there's, there's a link in the link roll to, uh, uh, there are a couple, on, there's an online utility that will, you can pitch your URL to it, like your, the base, base domain of your library, and it'll walk through and, tr and build a, a sample sitemap for you. Okay? So you don't have to do this yourself. You might modify that, but um, you would, there is at least a utility to, to get you going on that piece. Okay. Keep going. 9.40. Lots, lots left to do. Okay. So once you, you've kind of gone through those first, first couple of steps, right? The keyword analysis, you've started to structure your site in the right way. You've built uh, a list of suggested pages within your sitemap. Now what you can start to do is analyze what's in the index. So at this point, you've, you've allowed robots in to come and, and figure out what, what, piece, what pieces of your site to index. So now you can start to analyze where, where are things right, where are things wrong. Let me show you what I mean by this. This is an in-process um, digital collection, for instance. So if I do site, the site if you know the site qualifier for, um, so we've knocked this down. I, I don't have a screenshot of it, but initially it was in the 10,000 level of results. Here's the thing. I know that within this finding aid, we have about 489 finding aids total. So even if you round up and say every, uh, every one of those finding aids should be listed and you need the about page from the digital collection and the index page from the digital collection, that only puts us at 491. So this, this index is wonderfully bloated, right? Um, and this is what we're, you know, I, we've, I'll show you a couple of things we've done to kind of get it down to this, but it, it's going to be, by the time this is done, we should have about, oh, you know, 491 results for this type of site search. So if you're familiar with that site um, qualifier, you just put, you put your base URL, and I'll, I'll drop it so you guys can see it. Um, you put your base URL in. And then you, you'll get a, a document count, essentially a result count. But what you can start to see in here is if I, I know stuff like our dynamic pages search, if we do search, and now run it. Let's do This is where you get a sense of, so what, um, when I type that, do you see we had 4,000 hits? This one file, search.php, is duplicating 3,200 results. So this is the sort of, these dynamic pages are the ones where you go, okay, that's not, like, there's no need for me to let the robots go in and find out what to, to spider every search result, right? I have a core set of things that need to be in the index, the about page, a landing page, a collection page, a home page, and then the 489 finding aid item level pages. That's it. 
So this is what I'm talking about when you, once you've got stuff in, now you can start to analyze it and pick out the sort of what I would call um, noisy files that are generating and polluting the index. So the next step for me is to go in and turn off the um, search pages so that that doesn't come out in the search engine result pages. Two techniques to do that. I'm going to go through them. So the first one is um, a text file which, uh, with a set of commands at the top level of your site. So in your base directory, you know, if for, in our case it would be at the www.lib.montana.edu, right? In there, you drop a robots.txt file, and this is a set of commands. It doesn't; it can do lots of things, but it primarily says, "Yes, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Robot, go and find this directory, and, and you can index it. Otherwise, you, it, you can allow allow indexing. You can do wildcard." Um, in this case, what you're seeing is this command is saying, don't index the staff directory. Go into the finding aids only at the index page level and then also at the, the, the two variations of the index page level for, for the mobile site of finding aids. So it's just a way of sort of identifying that, what, it, what you want to be indexed. So this that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is setting up different um, different pieces of markup. You can see them there. So there's rel equals canonical, rel no follow, and there's a meta tag that tells, if you put a meta tag, that last one on a page, the um, a spider, a robot, would not follow or index anything on that page. So you basically turn off pages using this kind of markup. If you didn't want somebody to follow this rel no follow on a search engine or a search results page within your digital collections, you put the the a link gets a rel of no follow. If you wanted to identify, so one of the other problems with our particular site was that you'd get variations on uh, a URL. Let's see if I can get this. So you get Think about this. This would double your index. If this, if this happens. So we have a permalink that's part of our sitemaps that does this. That's the one we want in the index. But there's also, a, like, as you're working through our application, same page, right? Same, same uh, different URL, same page, and it doubles your index. So what you do is you create a uh, you assign, I'll show you this. I think we're all canonical in here. No, it's not in this one. I haven't done it yet. And having those both come up in the search results will confuse and possibly annoy someone who's exactly. looking for the one page. They keep they think they've got more results when really they haven't. They keep right. so Oh that's the same on. page I already got. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh there it is. It is in there. So what yeah. you get what you do is you identify the page that you want in the index with this kind of tag. So that, 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 cuts our, that cuts our index in half as far as our, instead of, um, what's 489 plus 489? Let's say um, 900 links for our item level pages, we only have 400. Because I just disambiguated the, I'm, again, I'm making up words. Um, I, I just told the, the index that you don't need to, that, PHP one with the ID, that, you don't worry about that. This is the URL you need to put into your index. Okay. Okay, this is, uh, this is more uh, earlier, uh, oh no, this is edge, I would say edge case. Um, but really what people are starting to introduce to help bots and search engines is what we're calling uh, Semantic tags and microdata. And you can kind of understand that, you know, in, in Google's parlance, they call it rich snippets or structured data. Um, but what it does is it allows you to add, so this is a, this is a perfect example. You add additional information into a, f a page 
that is kind of behind the scenes and then can bring out new information into search results. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So, but I, it's worth noting that in the browser display, this is before microdata and this is after microdata. Nothing changes, right? Nothing changes in the, in the user display. But if you're looking behind the scenes, this would be um, an example of a non a non-semantic, I mean it's got some semantics, so you can kind of see it's a definition list, uh, definition title, it looks like it's book data. But until we add stuff microdata, we don't get to a point where we can actually classify the item. So what I'm talking about, you don't see it on the front end, but in the back for the indexing, you get a whole new set of rich metadata, right? So you've got a scope that's identified. You can say that the stuff inside this DL is a book. Um, here's the title of that book. Here's the author of that book. There's the data. So right, you get you get all of this stuff now instead of a, a machine trying to even understand what what the difference between the first DD is. Look, if, let me look at this. The first DD versus the second DD versus the third DD. Right? There's no distinction between them. Right? But now with this newer markup, you can get that in. What you use is uh, there's a schema.org is a it's basically a controlled vocabulary a web classification vocabulary that Google, Bing, Yahoo have all decided and standardized around. So what you get there is a way to properly describe your pages. Let me show you what that does. So this one does have it. Indian Leopards does have it. So what it, if you if you think about it, you can kind of test what, what the index is able to pick up. But watch. So I, I ran the URL through here, and here's where you see. Looks like I got a couple things they want me to correct. Um, we've identified the stuff on that page as a video object, right? Which it is. We have um, we have a name, an author, we have a date, we have a duration, we have keywords, we have about section and a description. All of that is mined from that, let's see, it's right here, the very different pieces of that page. So like the, it's right here. Here's where the item scope for that page was identified. That's within the markup. Again, nothing really changes on the front end, but what you see on the back is a more qualified, uh, more defined page object, right? Create, you know, thing, creative work, media object, video object, and then inside of that you've got stuff like here's the item prop author, item prop published, date published, right? All that stuff is now machine readable. Newer, we, do, newer, we, um, we do have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, that yeah. You've been mentioning um, what is the difference between metadata and microdata? Um, metadata is a broader term. Microdata mm -hmm. is, is an HTML5. Uh, it's basically what you see on this page, but it's okay. all metadata, right? If, mm -hmm. that, if that makes sense. Microdata is the, the sort of practice of doing this encoded markup and using something like schema.org, that external vocabulary. Because that's where I get these, you know, you can see if I go to, I'll show you this. If I go to this URL, and not actually this one, because I have to hack off something. So basically the microdata is knowing how it works inside the web page there in the coding and basically gaming it, <laughs> gaming the system kind of to have it come up with, know what you want it to know. Yeah. I'd hesitate with the game, the gaming, because <laughs> it is it is viable. This is um, my interpretation. But you want to be careful. This is this is something that could blow up into that. So if you remember, there were keyword stuffing problems a long time ago. Where oh yeah. Just mm -hmm. stuff you know keywords into their meta tags, and and that that's another black hat SEO right. technique which has largely fallen off. 
Um, that's not really what's happening here, but you get a sense of, um, you know, it shows you how to do the markup so that it can be classified in a semantic way for linked data or for other, other sort of sub-uses. Um, and they are monitoring this pretty quickly, pretty mm -hmm. well. Um, so I'm hopeful that it wouldn't, it wouldn't degenerate into what we talked about, like the, the, gen, the keyword stuffing. Yeah, the technology has actually improved that that doesn't work as well anymore Once we now that we've got all this, yeah. It per, yes, and I, I haven't really touched on that here, but this the, I sort of mentioned an arms race with this stuff, um, and it is. Like, every, there's, a, I think the newest or the latest version of the algorithm is called Panda, and, the, you know, they come up with, you know, they come up with new revisions to how they're going to rank things and what, what is Black Hat SEO. Um, so they've uh, one example of this, like as that keyword stuffing was happening, Google saw it, realized it was no longer valuable, so now they, they don't index uh, meta keyword tags because they were abused, right? So it's that sort of correction that happens within the algorithms that um, that's why it's worth paying attention to white hat SEO and working through the sort of effective and vetted techniques that Google is suggesting or that Bing is suggesting. Because it is, you, you know, it's like you said. There's always there's a correction that happens. You know, as this stuff, if it got abused, there could be, there could come a time where they'd say, "Ah, eh, we can't use microdata anymore. Here's why." And so our newest algorithm, let's call it um, Baby Panda, doesn't pay attention to microdata anymore. That's something that you know, if you're doing this research, then you pay attention to and you uh, change your your routines according to whatever you're hearing. So there is a link to schema, so you should take a look at that just because it's worth knowing what that is and how you might do the markup. Um, again, this is early stages of it, and there's there's now studies related to what what can it what does the schema.org and microdata markup give you in terms of search results? If you look at something like um, here's one I did last night because I was quoting Lorcan MC. Okay, so this, the example here is like this, this microdata, this, the, the ability for us to see this stuff on the side here, that's largely based on something that Google mined off of the um, a Wikipedia page, but also Lurkin's um, weblog pages, potentially. Let's try it, let's try one more. Um, So here you can see we actually optimized our staff directory pages, and it's the first hit. And what you get is a bunch of different pieces of micro. If I click in there, you can see it. Watch what happens. View page source. See um, the actual data. We've schema.org person, and then all these these item prop, all that stuff is part of here's work location works for, it's my telephone. So all that stuff gets surfaced. So that it pulls it up into the little snippet there so people know exactly. right off the bat if you're the right guy they're looking for. Right. <laughs> so there can be really useful ways of, of doing this, especially when you think of like library resources. One of our biggest resources is people, connecting people with, you know, I would love to see somebody, you know, like somebody type in, here's a humanities, Jan Zuha. Humanities, that's our humanities librarian, and she would be the first, you know, her picture would appear on the right, and she would be the first uh, person, or first result. So, library guides, she's in the channel. Here she is. So the utility of microdata is definitely a hot topic of research related to SEO right now. Um, another tip of the hat, the, um, some of the stuff is coming out in the literature. Um, Kenning and Patrick, whom I mentioned earlier, Kenning Arlish, my dean, and Patrick O'Brien have um, put this out earlier this, or last year, um, about 
IRs, institutional repositories, and what they can do, and how to get that stuff into, how to get indexing ratios of IRs into Google Scholar. And then there's also others, um, there's uh, Diane Rasmussen and Daniel Onyafo are also looking at this stuff. And there's a nice introduction to what uh, just basic findability on the web with library websites. So not focusing just on institutional repositories, actually the other pieces of our website, like our standard web website. So I just didn't want to give another hat tip. Um, and then if you're interested, there is a book written by Kenning and Patrick. They are, and it's kind of interesting. It's actually fascinating and wonderful to be in this, to have the, these sets of resources to be able to have Kenning and Patrick in the building. But they actually wrote the book on SEO in libraries. So take a look at that if you're interested in, in a, a resource that can also get you up and running. Again, the stuff I've gone through today is kind of tip of the iceberg, right? Sort of baseline techniques for, for starting to do this stuff. But um, there's lots more, lots more to it, and if you're interested, there's lots of, lots of ways to start incorporating this, these techniques into your web development, and into your marketing for your library, and outreach for your so if you do have questions, feel free to find me here. Um, the, it sounds like Chris is going to have the, I'm going to send the PDF slides to her. So mm -hmm. she'll have those. Yes. But you can also use that URL that's there to, um, there are other talks there. I also have code samples on my site. If you're interested in other things, poke around. Mm -hmm. and nice. Please do stay in touch if, if, you're, if you do have questions. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Does anybody have any other questions? We, you guys popped up with some throughout the, sh the show. That was great. Um, we still have a few um, people left on the line. Does anybody have any questions right now for Jason while we still have him here? Um, as you said, yes, I'll have the presentation up. I've been putting up the links on our Delicious account. Um, and, of course, this whole thing is being recorded as usual. So all of that will go up um, probably later this afternoon, and everyone will be notified when all that's available. Um, we just have a few comments. Jason's saying, great, thanks, lots of good information um, in the, sh in the um, show. So, Okay, great. Well, I'm happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, there's a question. I'm not sure. I don't, the question from NLC staff says, full URLs for search optimization. Oh, where to have them somewhere on the site in the index? Where to have the full URLs for search optimization? Not really like the sure. Site, the site map? The yeah. The site map itself, where mm -hmm. it could live... Um, Usually we put it in a, a directory with whatever application we're, we're using, um, but it could live. It could live anywhere potentially. Mm -hmm. um, you just need to let once you register it with um, something like Google or submit it. You can submit it to Google or register it with Google Webmaster Tools. It just needs a URL. I tend to group it with with an application. So for instance, if this resources app had a sitemap, I would. It doesn't. But I, it, it would it would sit at this level, so it would sit with the the um, the application itself that it was mm -hmm. trying that you were indexing. I okay. hope that answers the question. Sort of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. I think it is a little after eleven. We will. Yeah. They said yes. That does. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. We will officially wrap it up. And yes. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, everyone, um, for attending. Um, as I said, the show has been recorded. So um, we'll have that up later with all the information. And I did tweet out the um, contact Jason with if he has questions using the hashtag, the L I B S E O, right? Was what you were, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, pound um, if, L I B S E O. I can mm -hmm. put it back up. So far. And so if anyone wants to, you know, want, you need more information, you want to know more about this, because this is, as you said at the beginning, just an, an intro. There's a lot that you can get in more into with all this. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely, you know, he's doing research on this. Would definitely want to talk to you and um, see what you ideas you guys have, or if you have any questions about it. Um, all the things that you mentioned have been added to our delicious, and links to the articles that you mentioned, the book there, um, and plus the, the your um, link role that you sent is all in there too. So there's a lot of resources out there that you can guys can get even more information from um, to read up on it yourself. Okay. So thank you very much, Jason. I'm gonna pull yeah. back the presenter control now here to my screen. <laughs> Okay, take care, everyone. Let's see here. Da, da, da. There we are. Switch. There we go.
And so, thank you very much for attending this morning, and I hope you'll join us next week. Let's see if I have the, there we go, um, where we our topic is genealogy resources for librarians. Um, we have two people here who will be joining us, I believe it's both of them, <laughs> Judy Cook and Cindy Cochran, who are from our local Lincoln Lancaster County Genealogical Society, and they've been doing some presentations, they've done it at other um, librarian meetings around the state, and so they're going to come on Encompass Live next week and talk to us about specifically resources that librarians can use um, if any of your patrons or users are doing genealogical resource, so um, re-genealogical research, <laughs> so hopefully you'll join us next week for that. Um, and we are on Facebook, and Compass Live is, so please do go ahead and like us there. If you are a big Facebook user, we post um, when our new shows are starting, any recordings are available, everything is always put on here. So definitely do um, a like us on Facebook if you are a big user there. Other than that, thank you very much for attending, and we will see you next week on Compass Live. Thanks. <laughs>